Welcome to Bening Podcast in the episode of Driving Humanity Forward and the Green Paradox. And today we will discuss about the cost of ownership and how do we accomplish together. Uh, presentator, or it will be presented by Paeko as usual. So Paeko, please start. All right, Pak. So let me share my screen. I hope you're able to see my screen. Yeah, it's visible now, Pak. All right, Pak. So um, today let's see uh, some uh, of the cost of ownership itself, what the customer, uh, all of us who buy the cars and what the government or policymakers uh, need to um, think about uh, in order to make it happen. Yeah? So let's start with these two pictures first. Uh, if I would um, ask uh, based on the model itself or the brand and uh, it's the same uh, class so it has a similar uh, seating capacities as five uh, person and the uh, power itself is very similar uh, 134 horsepower <clears throat> compared to 141 horsepower one is ICE the other one is EV so I can ask like what will be the preference to most of customer to, to buy which one? Yeah. Um, if you have any uh, preference, you can uh, say it so uh, before we go further to see what will cost you with this uh, preference. Yeah. So let's say if, um, if we want to buy the Honda uh, cars, or uh, some prefer maybe uh, this is more uh, modern look that I would like to buy Hyundai one. Um, I'll give you uh, the price that, that, that you have to pay if you want to buy uh, either of this car in Indonesia. So this is the price list for Honda. They have uh, uh, many models to, to choose from whereby uh, Hyundai itself only have one model, one, one type of this uh, uh, Kona. So the price list is currently like uh, Honda is ranging from 306 million to 429 million per unit on the road. And for Hyundai Kona is uh, 697 million per unit on the road. So if you just make a rough comparison with it, uh, as far as I know, there's not, um, there's no um, government uh, incentive so far. Uh, there, there is a, a tax cut uh, and so on, but it's not as big as what I see in other countries. Uh, let's say this is the, the actual uh, price that you have to pay. And if I just say that, uh, if I choose uh, not on the top line, probably on this line of a uh, uh, type of model for Honda, comparing the price head-to-head uh, -head is just like you can buy two of this for the price of one of this. Yeah. And so this is um, um, one area to consider as customer not to mention that you have to um, install a charging station at home and probably need to upgrade the uh, housing electricity uh, capacity and so on. Yeah? So this is one area whereby the customer is the, the one who have to uh, pay for it. Also, let's take a look at another comparison, which is in uh, US and in Germany. So this is what um, New Jersey has done a comparison between uh, two Nissan cars. Yeah. Same year, 
different model. One is EV, the other one is uh, ICE models. Um, the buying price itself, the EV is uh, much higher. And we can see also uh, tax is slightly higher, but on the fuel consumption comparing uh, paying the gasoline and the uh, electricity, it's about half of it. And the maintenance also is about uh, less, even uh, about half of it, yeah, or close to half of it. Uh, the difference here is, here is that there, there are some in incentives that uh, the governments are, are giving to those who are adopting as EV. So all in all, the end uh, cost that comes to customer, it looks like EV is cheaper. That goes the same to Germany, whereby the uh, initial cost actually EV is uh, slightly higher than the uh, normal ICE cars. But overall, after some uh, incentive and uh, plus the uh, lower maintenance, lower um, fuel or uh, energy power that we purchase, uh, in total, the EV looks like it is uh, cheaper. Yeah. So if I can summarize, this, what, what makes it cheaper is mostly because of government subsidy. So uh, be the in in a form of tax incentive or uh, early adoption um, uh, incentive. So it's still uh, a form of uh, price cut from a government policy. The real saving is uh, mainly from uh, the fuel uh, cost and the maintenance cost. Yeah. So this is one area that a uh, customer will have to pay. So comparing what, what is uh, available now in Indonesia, for example, and what is, has, has been happening in other countries like in US and in, in Germany, um, the cost that comes to customer definitely a lot different. Yeah. And since um, we talk about uh, government, what can government do and so on uh, to, to uh, make it happen, um, we don't expect that the car price, uh, the EV price will be lower soon because it's always uh, related to economic of scale where, whereby the more we produce, the more, uh, the, the cheaper it is. Yeah. So with the number of uh, or population of EV now in the world, whereby the take up rate is not that high yet, it will not uh, go down soon. So really a uh, government uh, policy that support this will, will play a big role. So let's see what the uh, uh, government of Singapore has been doing since the past 10 years. <clears throat> so at the beginning of uh, 2011, as far as 2011, there was uh, an intention from Tesla to, to sell their cars in Singapore. Uh, so uh, the government start to think about that. And uh, after five years later only, there are, there are 12, uh, 12 EV is available uh, or is, is on the Singapore road. Yeah. Some uh, customer or EV enthusiasts buy by themselves and then some are for um, research and so on. Yeah. Then there are hundreds of charging stations uh, island-wide and it keep on increasing uh, quite steadily from 2016, 2000, 2017, uh, 18. Yeah. If you see the numbers uh, from 12 increase to uh, 314, then 560. Uh, and at the end of uh, 2019, it reaches uh, 1,120, so which is quite high in uh, increment. But you take a look at the years as well. It, it, it is uh, close to 10 years. Yeah. So it's not something that uh, goes fast. Then on the other hand, actually, um, the private sector and the government also uh, join up together to, to, to do uh, more and more uh, charging station. 
and there's uh, this uh, company Blue SG also um, uh, introducing um, car sharing, which is based on uh, electric car. So they have uh, around uh, 130 uh, location, 130 unit uh, at uh, in in 2019. And then um, there's uh, additional uh, charging station uh, up to 1,800 uh, closer to 2020. And with the announcement of Hyundai that they are making or they are building an innovation center in Singapore that uh, boosts another uh, uh, kind of EV uh, momentum to Singapore. Yeah? And... But the increase itself from 2019 to 2020, one year later, is uh, only about 150 uh, unit. Yeah. Then uh, in 2021, early this year in January, uh, government launched another in initiative, which um, I can say it's, it's very uh, important pivot point whereby uh, government announced uh, an early EV uh, adoption by reducing the uh, ARF. Um, if the, the different way of uh, owning a vehicle in Singapore and, and in comparing to Indonesia, in Indonesia, we, we buy the car is inclusive, all the, the tax and so on. And we buy with that price. If it's on the road, it's on the road. And in Singapore, there are three uh, costs that involve in it, the vehicle cost itself. Then uh, the second one is the um, uh, certificate of en entitlement, whereby we need to buy first to own a car. Uh, this price also fluctuating. Um, normally, it's about the same price of the cars. And there's another pr uh, another cost that we need to pay, which is an ARF, which is additional registration fee, uh, some percentage of the car price itself. So what government do is uh, to to reduce this uh, ARF specifically for EV. So this in 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 early 2021. So with this January, uh, really give a. Uh, incentive to those who would like to switch to electric vehicle and uh, the charging point also uh, plan to increase uh, even up to another uh, 1,200 additional and then uh, the same company who introduced the um, electric uh, sharing uh, electric vehicles car sharing in uh, 2019, also increased the fleet. In uh, 2021, then uh, Tesla also have a green light to sell their cars in Singapore. Yeah. The most important is what happened lately uh, on this area. <clears throat> the additional uh, registration fee uh, is further uh, reduced. So it's up to uh, even zero for a certain models of EVs. So basically for those who buy uh, ICE cars, they have to pay that three component of cost, the, the car price, the COE and the ARF. And for uh, certain EV models, uh, the smaller uh, capacity of uh, engine, it can be only paying the uh, car price plus the COE. You don't have to pay the ARF. So it's quite a big cut from the um, cost of uh, ownership, yeah? so to buy a car itself. And, and it's not coming from the, the, the car price, not coming from the vehicle price, it comes from the government incentive to cut the tax. Yeah? Then on the other hand, at the same time, Singapore also announced that uh, it, it is uh, raising the petrol price by 15 cent per liter. So increasing uh, petrol size by 15 cent per liter doesn't look like a lot. But if you buy 10 liters, it's, it's already uh, cost, uh, cost an extra, extra cost of $1.50. And then if we 
multiply by um, weeks, months, and years, that will pile up quite a lot. Yeah. And on the other hand, at the same uh, period uh, this year, OCBC and DBS, the, the biggest two biggest uh, bank in Singapore, announcing that they are supporting the EV uh, uh, or opportunities. So I say OCBC is partnering with the charging uh, station. So they are partnering with the Charge Plus to build a charging station, whereby uh, DBS is announcing that they are providing a special loan for a green car. Yeah. Then uh, the, the next blow that the uh, Singapore government announced in March was that by 2025, so by 2025, there will be no more diesel car that can be registered in Singapore. So the current owner of diesel car, if the ownership or their, their, uh, their COE, so normally COE in Singapore is uh, valid for 10 years. So if the COE is uh, uh, valid until 2025, they can no longer uh, re-register it. Yeah. They have to dispose the car. Or on the other hand, um, if uh, a customer would like to buy a new, new car, uh, by 2025, they cannot uh, buy any diesel car anymore. Uh, so it's 2025 is not something that is going to be so far. It soon will come. Um, so the combination of uh, giving uh, incentive to EV owners and plus uh, charging more to the uh, petrol uh, car owners and uh, giving limitation to diesel cars uh, owners, uh, this uh, seems viewed by Singapore government as the way to, to uh, push the um, take up rate of uh, EVs in Singapore. And then the bigger um, vision is that by 2040, uh, Singapore will phase out all the pet petrol vehicle. Now, uh, we talk about before about the uh, the car itself is clean, but how about the uh, electric electricity source? So Pakausto mentioned that clearly. If you, if the car is clean, yes, it's it's nice, it's clean. But then, if the electricity is still sourced from um, a coal generated electricity, then uh, it's still the same. It's still uh, generating another carbon on the electric uh, electricity power plant. Yeah. Um, so what Singapore have now actually they have done it quite some times ago to to shift uh, to a cleaner energy. It's not really clean yet. So they they have shifting. Um, if you see this, uh, the the bottom part is um, um, mainly natural gas. So it's still not really a renewable energy, but it's it's uh, cleaner comparing to. Uh, coal and uh, petroleum products. So they are mostly uh, the the source of energy that uh, Singapore uses is a natural gas. They still have a few of petroleum product and still using a small number of coal, uh, and they keep on uh, reducing. And the focus now is to reduce all this non. Uh, natural gas. Yeah. There's a small number here which is already using uh, uh, others or more more or less a renewable uh, energy source. Yeah. So what Singapore did is um, they are they are shifting uh, the, this uh, small numbers of um, petroleum and coal into solar uh, power. Yeah. Why is it? Um, it's, it came uh, as, as far as uh, a study some years back that um, with, um, with the wind speed that Singapore has now, uh, about two meters per second in average, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not sufficient to, to run a wind turbine which need uh, around 4.5 meters per second. 
to, to run it uh, efficiently. So uh, this is one study that uh, Singapore government has done and um, about the naval uh, or tidal uh, power. It also, the, the, the uh, sea, land, uh, sea area or sea space uh, that uh, Singapore has, uh, so it also the, it's, it's not possible to, to have a, a, a tidal power generator because most of the, the sea surface are used for a shipping lane and uh, a ports. Yeah. Then the next one that they are looking into is uh, a hydroelectric. So it's not possible as well. Uh, Singapore ha do has a river. They have a few river, but it's not really a river like what we see in, in Indonesia or in India. But it has a, a river with a, a high flow of uh, water. Yeah. So hydroelectric is not possible as well in Singapore. The next one, uh, geothermal. There's no energy so uh, no no geothermal energy source in Singapore available. Uh, with a small physical size uh, and a high population, uh, the density of a population itself is also quite high. Um, minimum line, uh, minimum line. Uh, the sustainability of uh, domestic biomass also is not visible to be done. And if you take a look at nuclear power, it, it has a huge constraint on, on on the safety. So because how how far can we put this nuclear plant, uh, nuclear power plant from the island itself, and and it still poses uh, uh, a major safety risk uh, to Singapore itself and also to neighboring countries like uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. So, with that, this all this uh, option is not really visible for Singapore to develop. The only feasible solution that they can use to go uh, to, to have a renewable uh, power source is that they're going for a solar um, power generation. Yeah. And it helps that it can uh, generate uh, around two gigawatt, which is uh, aimed to be done by 2030. So at least it can uh, power some uh, 350,000 households a year. This will help uh, to, to uh, supplement the uh, power generator that is uh, powered mostly by the natural gas. So, um, So far from the first um, session to now the fourth session, we have uh, discussed uh, many topics. So at first, with uh, based on what Park Kostup has uh, presented, we discuss about the, uh, the uh, emission itself. So a lot of comparison about the emission. And we discuss about uh, complexity of the EVs, uh, comparing the complexity of the ICE itself, and what these two um, major automaker in the world uh, has views on uh, the coexistence and the uh, of EVs and ICE together, and. Um, Then I think we also discuss about complexity of the environment within the industries where um, it will impact uh, a lot of investment that has been done and uh, a lot of people that works here, that works at suppliers and so on. Uh, we discuss about this. And uh, lastly, today uh, we discuss about the cost of ownership itself. What what cost will come to the customer, and what cost that uh, the policymaker or the government need to think about to to uh, make it happen. 
Okay, Pak. So um, then we have to discuss later on uh, after this. What next? Yeah. What about uh, the economists uh, think about this uh, solution or this idea? And what about the environmentalists? What about the sociologist views about this ecosystem? We know that they will, they will have a, a, a economic and a social impact. And um, then, of course, not to forget about the government or policymaker views about this. All right, Pak Ika, Pak um, we can start the discussion. What do you think about that? Maybe see about it, yeah. Yeah, Pak firstly, thank you for bringing out a lot of points today. And as you have been covering in the last four uh, talk shows or the episodes as well, you have brought in very nicely of the various impacts in terms of the cost of ownerships, the vehicle itself, and also on the energy cost as well. So let's say like we have been debating or, you know, discussing on how we are perceiving one thing to be good. Uh, and we tend to focus that this is good, but on the other side, mm -hmm. it has a flip side and it again has an impact which we have not maybe foreseen or which we have not taken into a cognizance or consideration. Just to give you an instance, Pa, uh, if you uh, see the uh, graph which you showed that the Singapore is having the energy resource, which is more from a natural gas, right? Right. So as on today, yes, definitely natural gas is a very good option in terms of as compared to the coal mm. in terms of uh, a cleaner fuel to get the electricity. However, the challenge with natural gas is it emits a lot of methane. So if you yes. see uh, when you go to the methane, it's a much more stronger greenhouse gas and mm. has more damaging impact than a CO2 would have if you compare the same time frame of over 100 years or something. So mm. that's, uh, if I, re I remember correctly, it's more, it's 34 times more heavier than the CO2, right? Mm. So and it would be more damaging in that case. So yes, natural gas is a good option, but we need to define for what stage and what duration it is a good, because the focus has to be going more onto the renewable energies. Now, as you rightly pointed out that, you know, uh, there are constraints and these would be constraints uh, region wise, geography wise, nation wise and everything. Let's say exactly. like Singapore has, uh, Singapore does not have its own water source. So it is like dependent on Malaysia to get its waters, which you drink at mm -hmm. home, right? So similar way for other electricity options or the energy options, it will have to say depend on Malaysia or Indonesia or the neighboring countries. And as a group, how we can col collaborate on this. Mm -hmm. So again, it's bringing to the same point about the coexistence, because this is again for the humanity and for the only one planet where we stay. Mm. True. Any but... thoughts by Paika? Mm. Very complex. <laughs> eh? <laughs> <laughs> Very complex one. Can can you Paika? Can you move to the your last slide? Eh? Yes. So before sharing my thoughts, eh, I already share one point. Yeah, complex. Eh? <laughs> Actually, uh, what? I want to stress out again and maybe again and again. Uh, whatever the energy system that we are having now, actually it have a social impact and ecological impact, like a social ecological system. Right. And right. what Pa Kosu mentioned is methane have a ecological impact and so we must uh, rethink is it viable and for how many years yeah and the other side is the social social impact is based basically economic and livelihood like by cause stress out that uh, if we move to ICE then how about the job loss, how about uh, if we want to compensate job loss, 
how about retraining the education the workforce to which industry and we must also create new industry that is a lot of thought must go in that and a lot of investment also must go in that right. so yeah that is why i say it's complex mm-hmm. number one and number two actually the involvement of other side other actors like by convention sociologists environmentalists and everybody and finally the government as a regulatory body mm. is very important but again where do we start. all meet and start where do we all meet first mm. where that's what i said again complex because yeah i definitely believe that everybody is thinking in their own bubble the environmentalists maybe uh, oh, oh, natural gas methane dangerous but do they see the whole picture mm. the economists uh, or maybe the general population say like uh, by like say in singapore will 2025 no diesel they will yell oh no diesel but this is the cheapest way to transport goods and so on and so on and so forth exactly yeah. but but do they also see the other side and what what mm. will be the government uh, role in this making connection of everything mm. Mm. so why god this actually brings a very interesting point as you rightly said let's say there are different perspectives when you look at from a social angle or an ecological angle or an environmentalist angle mm-hmm. so we also need to assess how much is our academia prepared to have the addresses challenge because people who would be coming out freshly graduated from schools and colleges what are the challenges they would be you know heading to are we living them uh, a world which they desired or we have completely destroyed or where do you start so it's more of a same question which we need to ask the various agencies who are involved where do we start and how do we start mm-hmm. so basically we, in my opinion we will have to have a you know a common minimum program as as a guideline to start with and everyone plays his own role and mm. the orchestra would be done maybe by the government or the various agencies like ipcc and defining and identifying the various metrics which could be giving us a direction that whether we are heading in the right direction or on where do we need to improve up, upon mm. Mm. yeah so in, interesting uh, point pa costo ben paika what you brought uh, to uh, this discussion like I also agree that um, the complexity can be also different from uh, one country to another country, and even within a country itself, the different uh, province or different states can be also different. Like what happened in in US, uh, different state have different rules and so on. So, like what I have uh, shown here, or what. Government of Singapore has been doing to uh, promote the usage of EV and so on. Um, in one glance, I can say that what they do here is not directly uh, applicable if it is uh, going to roll out in Indonesia, for example. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned about uh, diesel uh, cars or or vehicle in general. Uh, In, in Singapore, there's a very uh, minimum numbers of trucks. Yeah, there are some trucks. Uh, most of those trucks are, are operated within the ports and uh, airports, and as well as uh, delivering goods from Malaysia to Singapore. And those delivering goods from Malaysia to Singapore will eventually go back to Sing- to Malaysia. Um, that can be a Another tweak of regulation where they can allow a diesel vehicle from Malaysia to enter Singapore, as long as they go back to 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 Malaysia again. Yeah. So the the regulation here only say that uh, 
they don't allow uh, diesel cars on and taxi to be registered again. And it's only cars and taxis. Yeah. So it doesn't include buses and trucks. So definitely those have they have think about that that they still need trucks and buses to uh, diesel truck and buses to run the economy yeah. and mm, yeah. this kind of incentive we, we, which we have not seen it in indonesia that's why we see the price of ev and uh, ic is about double yeah. so uh, that is not being visible in singapore because the uh, cost component also different Mm. Mm. Similarly, we yeah. we have seen it in India, Pap, that yeah. the uh, government is promoting the EV with uh, various subsidies and benefits mm-hmm. when a per- person buys an EV, right? And the government is focused on doing so because it has its own, you know, uh, advantages and disadvantages. But when we see from a nation's perspective, you need to also look into the aspect. How much is the population which is getting addressed? Say in case yes. of an in India, the population size is say 1.3 billion. Whereas in say Indonesia, it would be say around 28 million. The 280 million or something, right? 280, yeah. Mm. Yeah, 280 million. On similar ways, Singapore population is completely different. So yeah, if you see only 2.8 million. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so if you see the scale uh, and the infrastructure which is there so uh, if you compare with most of the developed countries uh, the people would be transporting or using the public transport for their commuting whereas mm. it's the developing countries where these local or the personalized transports would be used so now even the even within the transportation the definitions are changing it's more of a mobility kind of a purview which is uh, being taken by the various companies and mm-hmm. it's being addressed in terms of the various mobility solutions. So there are different ways it would be addressed. I hope we would be able to discuss the mobility aspect in our coming uh, forecast. And yes. it could be yeah. a good interpretations uh, about it. Another facet which I wanted to check with you, Paiko, was when you compared the two Nissan part uh, in the US, did in the cost of ownership, did we consider the battery replacement cost uh, at any given point in time? Because what happens is in an EV, uh, the battery would be going under replacement after a certain duration. So if you mm. say a life cycle of 10 years and this cost adds up, then in that case, the EV might seem still a costlier affair as compared to the current ICEs. Mm-hmm. Right. It seems like from the statement here, it, the maintenance cost that um, considered is not including the uh, battery replacement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So of course, some ad- some studies saying that uh, the the sum of current EVs uh, mm. even can can last the battery itself can last. Um, more than 10 years, which is the, the normal life cycle of the car itself. Yeah, but not, mm. not all have that capability. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's not included. But, so if we, we compare these numbers, uh, it's not included into that consideration. Yeah. You are right. But that, if that includes, then this maintenance cost might not be this low. Yeah. yeah. It would be still more or less the, you know, uh, same way. Or maybe yes. slightly higher. I mean, don't only know. slightly. Yeah, correct. Mm. Yeah, true. But so that's something which the time will tell how uh, the technology matures and how much it is available for the humanity to mm-hmm. make the best of its uh, use. Yes. Right. True. Right. So it's it's um. Uh, this this is just a direct comparison whereby uh, the the real cost um, the the tax uh, fuel and maintenance and the incentive that the buyers are mm. receiving from the government then all the data that are available in in any source it it will shows that 
EVs is having advantage comparing to IG. Yeah. Is is that really the case? Uh, that is the question that we we are asking now. And yeah, uh, that comes to the discussion. Yeah. One more interesting point, a uh, Paiko, which brings to the uh, mind is. Let's say, let's say we don't have IC engines anymore, and then there is uh, vehicles which are only moving in the EV space. So, mm-hmm. what happens to the prices of plastics, which are basically used to make most of the interior components and many of the components which goes in the EV and other FMCGs and consumer goods, right? Because plastic is a byproduct of extracting the Uh, petrol diesel or the or various petroleum, refer- yes. yeah petroleum products mm. right so if the global demand for say the petrol and diesel is zero whether the pl- plastic prices would still be the same or they would increase or how exactly that's something also we need to take into cognizance uh, maybe not today but at a later point in time because right. the refineries mm. if are making certain profits today by selling mm-hmm. of petrol and diesel or the crude and they are not uh, you know charging those costs on the plastic prices then and suddenly the plastic uh, the petrol diesel is stopped what happens to the plastic prices then right. are we have the comparable price or do mm-hmm. we have uh, all together new price points because then they would be commanding the market as well correct yeah so it's, it's instead of uh, uh, it 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 comes as um, uh, a by product of a fuel yeah then instead of that we need to produce plastic from from uh, uh, oil itself yeah so it, of definitely that will will have a, an impact on cost of uh, production yeah so Paika, you have any other point <laughs> to add on? <laughs> I think you, yeah, you, 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 you I, wait I to just, say something. <laughs> I just want to highlight, we are getting very, very technical. <laughs> I mm-hmm. understand because we are engineers, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. considering the population of the viewers, but yeah, I think that, that, that is a good and valid point to highlight if the petrol is only for Uh, become zero and then uh, it is used mainly to produce plastic. How about the the price of the plastic? That is a very valid point. Uh, I hope the viewers understand this point. Uh, if if mm-hmm. not, then we 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 will need to have a discussion about the whole plastic industry. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> just just to make the viewer uh, viewer understand that everything is linked. Right. I, I think I think the main point in today's uh, presentation and discussion is that everything is linked. So yeah. you cannot take only one and then dissect it and use it as an approach to solve the whole issue of shifting the ecosystem. That is the main True. message here. True. Yeah. True. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, why I brought out this point because. We have many things to study. We saw the social angle, we saw the ecological angle, but something has to be done for the economists as well. So yeah, <laughs> they yeah. would be helping us and guiding. If yeah. one of the element is uh, getting you know disturbed, then how the overall economy or the linked economy yeah. would mm-hmm. work, and yeah. basically they would also recommend the government like what should be the policy decisions and what should be the Best way yeah. forward. So basically, it's a movement path. So everyone has to play its own role, and mm. have to have those kind of aligned targets so that we know we are progressing in the right direction. Mm. The, yeah. the main intent is yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, but please continue. So the main intent is to uh, you know limit the temperature rise of one point five degrees as per the. Uh, what uh, the nations have agreed uh, on the various methodologies and actions which they would like to take on that. Mm-hmm. So everybody is looking forward for what happens on 26th of October in Davos on the uh, yeah. okay. economic forum and then see what exactly is the next steps and way forwards where almost all countries would meet and discuss on these variety of aspects in that. Mm-hmm. 
So, uh, yeah, because time is also up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to cut. But never mind if you want to discuss, uh, make a, another episode about the plastic. I think it's uh, it would be great. But anyway, for this this uh, episode, what what mm-hmm. I would like to say, like Pakos uh, mentioned, that everybody must uh, play its role. Exactly. That is why that is why that uh, transdisciplinary approach or transdisciplinarity concept is coming. Mm-hmm. You see, in I forgot 1978 or 19, uh, I think 1978, UNESCO held a, like a seminar on transdisciplinary, and their conclusion about transdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary is that if a collection of people is trying to make a banquet to serve a banquet for others to enjoy then each actor in that preparation of banquet must concentrate to his or her job only and then communicating with the others to make that banquet a successful event. So by concentrating to their own role and responsibility, but also communicating, then the whole event, in this case banquet, will be a success. So that that is very, I think a very powerful message because there seems like a paradox you concentrate on your role, but you still communicate with the other party. Yeah. So and communication is the key while we focus on our role. Yeah. Mm. And I think that is why in this episode, the we must reach out to the other party now. Sure. From yeah, from the uh, for the other, we must re- reach out to the others. And let us communicate together. Yeah, but, sure, pa. Sure, pa. Yeah. I completely agree. Mm. So maybe just to conclude, what I could say is, let's say like, as the doctors have the oath, we engineers uh, have the obligation to create. And then basically this creation, uh, what is happening on this only planet where we stay, has to mm-hmm. be in fulfilling the requirements as well. So it is not further damaging, but have the options of or the benefits of protecting it as well so Mm. that's something we can uh, conclude and communicate to the other fraternities who are involved in the overall social aspects and social fabric yeah so we agree on that by coin yes Yes. so definitely let us let us try to uh Invite others to join our conversation. <laughs> sure, pa. <laughs> okay, then. So, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paiko and Papas, too. Thank you, so, Paiko. Uh, pleasure, thank pa. you, Paiko. We will meet in the other episode, hopefully, with the others to join in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, pa. Yeah. Thank you.